do, do you remember, folks? Thank you. Do you remember, um, probably as very young children, when there was trifle fatigue? And you hoped that there would always be a second helping. Well, of this particular trifle, we've already had three helpings. <laughs> and we want more because it's a rich and wonderful trifle and there's at least half a bottle of sherry in it. <laughs> and so we are going to be lucky and we are going to get our fourth helping. But my analogy of a trifle is stupid because what we've been offered is not trifling at all. But we're still going to get fourth helping. Well, I'd like to uh, echo, can you hear me? That's all right. Oh, a nice cool breeze. Oh, that's lovely. Oh. Um, I'd like to echo what um, Helen Ann said before about uh, my personal sense of gratitude at being invited to be here. Can you hear all right? Um, and it's been a huge privilege. Uh, and I should go, I will go away with a huge enthusiasm uh, for some of the things, I mean all of the things going on in the diocese. <laughs> no, but for, for some of the enthusiasm and hope, I know it won't always feel like that on the ground. And I'm very grateful to Bishop Alistair, who was the person who first asked me to come. So it's been a great, a tremendous experience for me. Um, I want to end with these closing verses from the Gospel of John, chapter 21, verses 20 to the end. Um, the last verse stands alone, and I'll come to that uh, in a little bit. First verse is 21 to 24. When Peter saw um, him, the disciple whom Jesus loved, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about him? Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? Follow me. So the rumor spread in the community that this disciple would not die. David Ford, I've just remembered at this point, I don't know whether he wrote this down or said this to me verbally. Isn't it interesting that even in those days, the churches were full of gossip? <laughs> <laughs> the rumor spread in the community that we're going to get a new vicar or anyway, no matter, that this disciple would not die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die, but if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? This is the disciple who is testifying to these things and has written them. And we know that his testimony is true. First, that first verse, Lord, what about him? On one level, that's almost refreshingly humorous, isn't it? Peter's just been given this daunting uh, vocation, uh, which I'm suggesting is particularly appropriate for the church of office, that dimension of church we think of as visible and institutional, care of all of Christ's sheep, not just Christians, but all of Christ's sheep, feeding and teaching them, uh, and going out of the boat, stepping out vulnerably and at cost into the world. And understandably, Peter, very humanly, but how interesting that this is, is included in the scripture, is uncomfortable when he looks at someone else who seems to be getting an easier ride. What about him, smooth git? Look, <laughs> he's an area bishop, or he lives in Kakubri, or you know, whatever it is, he appears to have a softer option. Why can't I, and so on. It's a very human response, isn't it, to ask ourselves, why, why can't this person uh, be going through what I'm going through? Why me is another way of praying the same thing. And can I suggest, maybe it's just because I, I'm not a New Testament scholar, as by now will be embarrassingly obvious, but I am a keen student of Christian spirituality. And for me, this, like so much of John's Gospel, makes its best sense when you understand it as prayer. This is the prayer of lament feeling safe to bring our questions into our relationship with Jesus. Lord, what about him? Like the great Psalms, remember? Or the prayer or cry of any child to its parents. Why do I have to do this when he or she doesn't? Do you know what I mean? Why have I got to walk the way of cancer when this person doesn't? It's both, of course it's not 
you know, the best part of us, but it's a part of us. And like all those difficult parts of us, please, I'm not going to talk about the Psalms at all today, but let me just say that, that their raw honesty uh, is precisely why we must stick with them and pray with them, because even when you're not feeling envy or disquiet or whatever it is, other people will be, and you can pray that prayer for them, as they, on other occasions, will pray for you. Why me, and what about him? But let's move on. Notice in those few verses, once more, uh, again, a kind of inclusio, a, a drawing together of the prologue and the epilogue. Um, the, the appearance of we in verse 24 uh, picks up the appearance of we in the prologue. Remember, uh, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we, suddenly we appear. The story is about us, and the same thing happens as we come to the very end of the gospel. But there's an even bigger connection between the beginning of the gospel and the end of the gospel. In fact, two others. Um, and uh, what I want to suggest here is that just as the church of office, the structured church, has these two particular vocations of pastoral care and stepping out into the world, so the contemplative church, the church of love, the hidden, less noisy, less spectacular, but utterly crucial part of the body of Christ, has two vocations, and they're spelt out here. The first is to abide. The second is to bear witness. So first, abiding, one of the richest words in the Gospel of John. And here again, knowing Greek, even the modest amount that I know, is a priceless gift. Um, because the word, uh, the Greek word, very ordinary word, I think I'm right saying you correct me, meno or menai, M-E-N-O or M-E-N-E-I-N in the infinitive form, means to abide or to live with. It's not a particularly exciting word, I don't think, uh, but it comes over 40 times in the Gospel of John and the letters of John. And I think, if I remember rightly, but here I am a bit vulnerable to being picked up, uh, only twice in the rest of the New Testament. Uh, one of the lovely things Bishop Helena was saying uh, the other day was um, about uh, the road to Emmaus. And I'm almost certain that's one of the only other places outside John's writings where the word meno arises. What is it? When they ask Jesus, do you remember on the journey, to come and abide with them uh, in, the, in the house. It's the same word. The trouble is in English, of course, we lose this because the word, you lose so much in any translation. Um, the King James Version, I'm not a great groupie for the authorised version, but it is nearly always closer to the literal meaning of the Hebrew or Greek than the modern translations are. And the only way, other than learning Greek, which would be the best way, but the only other way to see just how important this word is in John's Gospel is to read the Gospel through in the King James Version. And then you will see for yourself. Because in the NRSV and the NIV, here, the, the version I've just read to you was the NRSV, and it translates meno, uh, remain. Which is perfectly I think, okay, isn't it? But it's, it's a bit boring, isn't it? I mean, remain has enough of the... The AV, the KJV, almost always translates it as abide. Be at home with. Um, and that, the NIV, I see here, translates it in, in John 21, verse 22, as remain alive, if it is my will that he remain alive until I come. That, anyway, never mind. It, I think it's important to, if you want to see what it means, uh, to look at the King James Version. But let me, to save time, um, give you two illustrations from John's Gospel of just why this word that comes over 40 times is so fundamental to the way John is presenting the truth of Christ to us. The first example comes in the very first chapter, uh, where the word menine comes three times in two verses. Uh, uh, you can look it up if you want, or I'll remind you of the passage. John 1, 38 to 42. When Jesus turned and saw them following. These are two disciples. Remember John the Baptist says, look, there is the Lamb of God. And he lets his disciples go. It's this wonderful spirituality of Christ must grow greater, I must step out of the way. That we're not always very good at. John the Baptist is our exemplar. They leave him to inquirers, searchers, coming into your church on a Sunday morning, wondering what all this stuff is about. Jesus sees them and says, what are you looking for? They said to him, I'm quoting 138 in the NRSV, but I'm going to translate the word men I abide each time it comes here. They said to him, Rabbi, brackets, which translated means teacher. Why are we being told that? Where are you abiding? 
Ecumenites, I think it is. But he said to them, come and see. They came and saw where he was abiding, and they abode with him. Three times that word comes, that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus and spent this time abiding was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, brackets which translated means anointed. He brought Simon to Jesus. What's going on? Two inquirers looking to explore who Jesus is. Does this begin to feel familiar? People who are not all that sure about church, but they are intrigued by Jesus. What do they call him? Rabbi, teacher. Okay, that's fine. It's a fairly neutral word. I presume there were good rabbis and bad rabbis, as there will always be good priests and good teachers and bad ones. So it's a neutral, it's a term of respect, but it's not a commitment of any kind. Rabbi, where are you staying? Where are you abiding? Where are you at home? Where and how can we get to know you, teacher, a bit more so we can decide one way or the other about you? I'm, obviously, I'm paraphrasing. But I suggest all of that is implicit in, that, uh, in, in the, what it is they, they, they asked Jesus. And he says, come and see. So they abide with him for some space of time. We're not told what happens. We don't need to know what happens whether words were exchanged or whether they had a drink, uh, I mean, a, you know, a refreshment, or what happened, it doesn't matter. They abode with Jesus. What happens? They move from being spectators to being participants, from seeing Jesus as a teacher to seeing Jesus as Messiah, uh, from being people on the edge to being evangelists, who then the first thing they do is to go out and find others and bring them Andrew brings his brother to say, we have found the Messiah. What makes the difference is abiding. That's how important this word is. One other example. Uh, in John 14, the farewell discourse, which is really, I in fact, I was wondering whether to do all my Bible studies just on that because it's so full of richness and the theme of abiding reaches its climax there, especially in chapter 15. And you could say the whole of the farewell discourse, which is like a long extended table conversation culminating in that astonishing prayer, is all about abiding, living together at depth, being at home with each other. But in the middle of it, there's that wonderful prayer of St. Jude or Jude or Judas. Remember in chapter 15, 14 verse, dash it, I haven't written it, I think it's verse 23, I think it is, where you've got that lovely bit, I better look it up, I can't get it wrong, um, and it says something like Judas, brackets, not Iscariot. I love that. <laughs> this is Jude as in St. Simon and St. Jude, you remember. You can imagine if he'd been in a con, 22, is it? 14 verse 22, bless you. Um, Judas, brackets, not his... Imagine him walking through one of these conference things with one of these things on, saying, Judas, brackets, I'm not Iscariot, he's the other one. I'm the good guy. <laughs> Poor bloke. No wonder he's the patron saint of lost causes in the Roman Catholic Church. <laughs> saint Jude, as in St. Simon and St. Jude, this geezer, he, I mean this person in John 14, only gets two moments on stage in Scripture. The second is the letter attributed to him, but I suspect it's almost certainly not by him. Uh, I think it's very unlikely. And if it isn't, the only line he gets in the whole Bible is John 14, verse 22. And doesn't matter, because it's a cracking line. What he says to Jesus, I've forgotten, <laughs> but it's something about, well, I mean, I know, but I can't remember the exact word, but it's something about what's, the, wait a minute, John 14, verse 22. Um, Judas, brackets, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will reveal yourself to us and not to the world? In other words, what on earth, Lord, is the point of the church? Why did you bother with it? <laughs> why didn't you, sorry, it's not funny at all, really, but why did, you not, why did you not reveal yourself directly to the world? Why bother with synods and bishops and all the rest of the, um, well, I mean, I'm pushing, but that, that's the gist of what he says, isn't it? Why and how? Uh, should you want to reveal yourself to a special community in some way. And Jesus' answer takes us to the heart of the mystery of abiding, and the familiar word menine reappears. Jesus answered and said to him, "If any, I'm translating the, the Greek, is, I have to say, very easy here. If anyone loves me, agapao again, loves me with all they have to, to give, the word of me this person will keep, 
and the father, my father will love that person again, this full word agapao, and come, we will come to him and abide, or literally, it's the noun there, isn't it? Make our home with him. Have you got something like that in your... Um, Jesus says, the only reason for having a church is to have a community of mutual homemaking, of mutual abiding with each other and with Christ at his heart. Christ, who makes himself homeless, looks for a home in our lives and in our church. That's familiar Christian teaching. It reaches its, or rather, it, it, it finds its surest focus in John 14.23 and in the mystery of abiding what does it mean in practice? This immensely rich word, uh, creating a home together, an inclusive home rooted in unconditional love. Um, uh, well, it means a way of living together. And what Jesus is saying to Jude is, a church that manages to create, even to a limited, fallible human extent, something of that quality of mutual living together will bridge the gap between God and world. Will, will be whatever words we say will commend itself by the simple quality of our mutual living together to a world that's so full of doors being slammed in people's uh, faces. Abiding has to do with migrants, has to do with refugees, but it also has to do with outsiders because at the heart, can I suggest, of the idea of mutual abiding in the Gospel of St. John is a making space for the other. If you want to live with, it's not rocket science, if you want to live with anybody at all, even a golden retriever, well, especially a golden retriever, but if you want to live with a husband or wife or partner or child or someone else, you have to make space for them. Isn't that right? Both physically but also spiritually. And in order to do this, you have to rearrange your own emotional and spiritual furniture. That's a phrase I owe to a, a friend of my wife, so talking about this kind of thing with a psychotherapist. And I, this whole notion of, uh, I mean, if somebody new comes into your church, they may not want to draw any attention to themselves, or they may, whatever, they will need you to make space for them. And that means a willingness on your part to be open-hearted. Do you see what I mean? To rethink a little bit your, the way you've mentally and spiritually arranged your life, your heart, your faith, and your church building. It has implications for all of that. It's costly, it's draining to, to abide at depth with people. But it is the only way a Christian community can genuinely model, or to use the Christian word, incarnate the unconditional love that we see reflected in the love of, of the Father and the Son uh, in the world today. It's hard work. Jerry Hughes, some of you may remember, was a, 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 I didn't know him very well, but a Jesuit writer who died last year of cancer in his early 90s, an inspirational figure. I had the privilege of knowing him a bit because my wife was a very close friend of his. He was the Roman Catholic chaplain at the University of Glasgow when she was a medical student there, and she was with him a month or so before he died. And I remember her, but he, I'm not mentioning him for that. I, 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 I mention him because of his wonderful books, especially God of Surprises, some of you will have come across. And in one of his books, I don't remember if it's that one, but I also heard him do it in the flesh, and I can't do justice to Jerry Hughes any more than I could to Joe Brand, but, but let's not go there again. <laughs> Jerry, Hughes, Jerry Hughes has a thing in one of his books, and I saw him do it in Litfield Cathedral once, and somewhere else too, about this kind of Ignatian exercise thing, about how would you respond if Jesus came and knocked on your door and wanted to, he don't think he used the word abide, but that's the question he put, if Jesus wanted to come and spend the night with you, how would you react if you knew beyond all doubt that it wasn't your friend pulling a fast one, it really was Jesus? Jerry Hughes is, I can't do it with the wit and depth of subtlety that he did it, uh, but the, basically what he says is, probably first of all, you'd be really rather chuffed. Well, I hope you would be, wouldn't you, if Jesus came round, it'd be really rather smart. You'd feel, goodness, he's picked me. So you'd invite him, at least I hope you'd invite me, and then you'd probably, you'd think of an excuse to slip into wherever your phone was and phone um, uh, uh, Bishop Richard or uh, <laughs> Justin Welby or someone to say, oh, hello, Richard, how are you? Jesus has come to stay with me. <laughs> Pity about you. <laughs> He's chosen me. You'd be terribly chuffed. Well, I would hope you would be anyway. But from then on, says Jerry Hughes, it would gradually get more and more difficult. Why? Because you'd have to rearrange your emotional and spiritual space. For example, he makes it very you know, light, but he makes the point that it's actually a costly changing of life involved. This is why Christianity is a life-changing faith. 
and you'd have to think what do I do with Jesus when we come towards supper? Would he be a vegetarian? Would he want a G&T before we get that far? Or have to make him a cup of green tea or something like that? What about bedrooms? I can't stick him in the box room with all the, you know, that I have to put him in our room. We'd have to move into... You see what I mean? It would gradually get more awkward. What about the next morning? Do you leave him at home or take him to Tesco's and say to the per person on the checkout, oh, by the way, this is my friend Jesus. Yes. No, no, it really is. Yes. It wouldn't be easy. And Jerry Hughes's point, I don't want to play to the gallery, Jerry Hughes's point is, you'd end up doing this, he suggests. You'd, you couldn't bear the thought of him going off somewhere else. So what you do is, you put him in the broom cupboard. You'd lock the door, you'd put a little sanctuary lamp up above it, and every time you walk past, you'd genuflect as you went past the door. you make the sign of the cross, but you keep him locked in there. And that, says Jerry Hughes, is by and large what the Christian church has done its damnedest to do for 2,000 years. Do you see what I mean? No, 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 don't, that's not my... Um, that's not my... That's Jerry Hughes's a profound... But it, although it's light and amusing, it's also extremely challenging. Genuine abiding is costly. Uh, and allowing space for Christ Jesus, the risen Christ, in our hearts is a d deeply demanding thing. And because we feed Christ in each of Christ's sheep, lambs, and we are one ourselves, abiding will always take all we have to give to it. It requires, among many other things, um, those of you who are Scots here, I'm only uh, half Scots, but the, the lovely Scots word my mother used to use a lot when, she, when I was young, she said, oh, you're awfully thrawn today. Anyone Scottish here know the word thrawn? Yes, oh, you would. <laughs> thrawn means kind of stubborn, doesn't it? Sort of determined. I won't, I won't do that. You know, that, I mean, that's an example of it. But Thrawn also has a quality, which I always associate with Glaswegians, but I'll be careful what I say. It means a kind of refusal to give up on people, a kind of dogged hanging on in there. Do you know what I mean? And that is part of abiding. Remember St. Paul, who has a very different ecclesiology from John, uh, the body of Christ, but in 1 Corinthians 12, about the one thing no one bit of the body can say to the other bit is, I've got no space for you. No, I have no need of you. Abiding involves that mediating, that thrawn, that determined, quiet, stubborn willingness to, to stay with one another. You did not choose each other. But if we can model in a community that sometimes each other, like the rude people uh, Neil was talking about, drive us to distraction, a quality of faithfulness to each other and of unconditional love, then, Jesus is suggesting, and only then, will we have something to say or to communicate and will we be able to bridge uh, the gap with the world. And in that sense, although I have no more time to do other than just refer to the word, abiding has about it not just a quality of thrownness, but a quality of adoration. We might not use that word, I, you remember the old thing about um, adoration, um, um, confession, oh, uh, supplication, no, uh, thanksgiving and supplication. I, I don't know about you, I can just about, well, confession doesn't come easily, but I can do my best. Thanksgiving is a bit easier, supplication is a bit easier. Adoration is the most difficult. Adoration is the time or love or reverence you give to someone else when you're not looking for anything in return. It's profoundly the opposite of a world obsessed by outcomes and productivity and immediate getting a reward on your investment. Adoration might mean several hours with one person dementing or one person uh, who may never respond in any way to you uh, without looking for anything back. And it's the most precious ingredient, I suggest, of any healthy Christian relation, certainly of Christian agape. Uh, it's what God in Christ offers to us. It, it's the investment that you give without any kind of utilitarian expectation of what you might get back out of it. And it's at the heart, it's the secret dynamism of a mutual, a rich mutual abiding. But let me go on to verse 24. This is the disciple who is bearing witness or testifying to these things and has written them. And we know that his testimony uh, is true. Here's the second great ingredient of the church of love, the contemplative uh, church, abiding and bearing witness in the way we live our lives. I was talking to one of you about Richard Borkham's wonderful book, um, uh, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses, in which he, he explores and argues uh, based on a, a very careful study of, of early uh, classical history, people like Tacitus and 
Thucydides and Herodotus, the way they wrote their history, and concludes that all early history was written based on the testimony of eyewitnesses. Uh, and wherever you possibly could, you would authenticate what you're writing by uh, drawing in the name and the testimony of the person who, who witnessed it, right? Just as very good journalism would do today. Um, and uh, Borkham's argument, therefore, is that far more of the New Testament, of uh, the Gospels, rather, um, than uh, uh, that we've hitherto supposed is based upon eyewitness testimony. To, I mean, there are all sorts of issues that raise us, and there isn't time to do more than just mention it now, but it helps to explain, for example, why some people have a name in the New Testament, even when the role they play is extraordinarily small. Think of Malchus, the geezer who got his ear cut off. Do you remember when Jesus, uh, no, G uh, Jesus was being arrested? We don't know anything more other than the, his name. Why are we told his name? Borkham suggests because he was a witness. He either, he, someone knew him or he himself became a Christian. And when the, the Gospel of John was first written, the writer could say, I got this from Malchus. Go and ask him, he's there. If the name is not given, it's very likely because the person, although still an authentic witness, has died and is simply not available to be approached. But it's all about first-hand testimony. And the Gospel writers, he argues, take much more care than we thought they did to authenticate what they're writing on the basis of the, by naming the people, you see what I mean, the people that they got it from. Uh, that may well be why the otherwise very embarrassing story of Peter's denial is included there at all. Why otherwise would you include in your, you know, gospel this embarrassing story about the chief apostle making a fantastic, uh, I was about to say a rude word, uh, <laughs> an alter a fantastic mess up uh, <laughs> at the critical moment of Jesus' arrest. Because either Peter himself acted as a witness, the likeliest explanation, or somebody else saw it, and it was incontrovertibly true. So um, this is all about, you might say, as I said at the beginning of, of the first of these Bible studies, that all these, uh, the, 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 this great chapter of John's Gospel is all about uh, the, the witness of failures, um, supremely here of Peter, uh, whose, whose failure is redeemed and whose witness is nonetheless preserved. This is a huge subject, and I've got no more than just to, 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 to remind you of how large a subject it is. Bearing witness to the truth of the risen Christ. How do you, day by day, witness to what God has done in your life today? Where is God? This is a matter for spiritual direction more than standing up here now, but it's fundamental to this idea of bearing witness. What did you see or feel or glimpse today that is of God, and how might you witness to that? Uh, what is God drawing you for the next stage of your own life or the life of your church into? Where is God saying, let go? Where is God asking you um, to, to go forward, and, uh, and how can you bear witness to this thing? And there's another huge dimension of this. Um, I have a fascinating article a friend of mine uh, gave me by a chap called Richard Blackwell, who's a psychotherapist who spent much of his life working for an organization called the, um, uh, anyway, I think it was called the Medical Foundation for Victims of Torture. So he was dealing with these deeply, deeply traumatized people over years. It's a most moving article. And he starts by saying, when I look back on my career as a psychotherapist with people who've gone through these traumas, um, I realized that my first mistake was I wanted to be helpful. A very human thing to do. But I gradually had to come to see that wanting to be helpful often said much more about my need to be needed than it did about where they were. But there were three things, he said, that um, I found I could always do for them. Hold, contain, and bear witness. I could hold them in the sense of sometimes physically holding them if that felt right for them in order to feel they were trusted. I could contain them, which I think is what happens in the Lament Psalms. God contains our cries of anger and despair as well as our joy and our gratitude. And the therapist does something, I'm not suggesting God as a psychotherapist, that would be a bit worrying, but the, the, the suggestion that you can, in spiritual guidance or in therapy or in a, a, a church conversation, you can contain people's anger or rudeness and um, whatever it is, even though sometimes that's costly for you. But thirdly, says Richard Blackwell, and the highest thing I could offer, even if I didn't feel I could do anything specifically to help them, I could bear witness. The greatest difficulty, he said in the article, and you can imagine this, for victims of torture, as of child abuse, is the fact that they don't think anybody will ever believe them. So to act as a witness, 
I will be a witness for you, however far you feel you can accept what they say, uh, is a, both a costly in-between kind of role, but also a prophetic one in a world where so many people have no voice, no one to listen to them. We can bear witness for each other, and each other can bear witness for us. We can give a voice to those who have no voice, and others can give a voice to us. I was just thinking this morning, I'm afraid to say for a second, in the Book of Common Prayer, morning prayer, my mind wandered, uh, and I, I, I was looking at the words, we weren't saying them, embarrassing, but we, 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 uh, we weren't saying the words of the Song of Creation, or the Benedicity, which I hadn't looked at for a while now. Um, but I, you remember, it comes originally in the uh, Greek version of the Book of Daniel. Um, now, in the Protestant Bible, it's, in, it's put on the words, on the lips of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Do you remember those three stalwarts who were thrown into a furnace by a brutal ruler called Nebuchadnezzar? And you might have thought uh, they would come out with a psalm of lament or something. No, they don't. They say, bless the Lord, O you whales, and all that move in the water, O you rabbits, or... No, I don't think it... No, it doesn't matter. Anyway... <laughs> But it does, well, almost, doesn't it? It brings in all of creation. Why? Not because they're saying, oh, how sweet, look at them bunnies running about. Because what they're saying, it's an act of defiant, bearing witness. What the three of them are saying is, we may burn in this furnace, but we're still not bowing down to your statue, because even if we are not here to bear witness to our God's rule and our God's ultimate victory, the stones and the whales and the rabbits will bear witness. Do you see what I mean? So mag and against that childlike defiance, Nebuchadnezzar has already lost. Game set a match to England against the... Anyway, we're, we're, it's, whatever it is, Andy Murray, please go. It's, it's bearing witness is, is a, a, a both a, co a costly, personal, but also a profoundly corporate thing. We exist to bear witness both to the needs and suffering of people across the world and to one another. And in finding new and imaginative and effective ways of doing that, uh, we begin to bridge the gap. And this brings me finally to the very last verse of the Gospel, this extraordinary conclusion. But there are also many other things that Jesus did. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that the world itself could not contain or have room for the books that would be written. Now, you can read that as grandiose rhetoric, conventional rhetoric, and there are plenty of examples in early uh, classical literature of people, and no doubt now too, ending like a coda to a great symphony, you know, ending on a sort of blaze of splendor, but a bit really just a little bit of empty bombast. I don't, I passionately believe it is much, much, much more important than that, because it introduces, um, well, two things, um, that, that one of which takes us to the very heart of, of the Gospel of John, but before we get to that, there's the sudden appearance of the I, the writer. Have you noticed that? If every one of them were written down, I suppose that the world itself, against all expectations, at the very, very end of his story, his or her story, the anonymous, uh, I, I, I think of as almost diffident, early church fathers like St. Irenaeus believed that the writer of John's Gospel must be the most humble of people because he reveals his own identity or her own identity from us. At this moment, and only at this moment, do we get just the curtain drawn back for a second and a tiny, tiny hint of this person. He pops up right up at the very end. I've mentioned already um, um, Thomas Gardner's beautiful book, uh, John in the Company of Poets, and his own very last line. He's the only commentator I know who draws attention to this sudden appearance of the eye, the narrator, at the very, very end of the story. Thomas Gardner ends his own book with these words. The I, meaning the me, I mean not the E-Y-E, -E, but the, the, the writer, the I, effaced throughout the gospel, quietly shows itself, though only as a pointer or witness or reflection, and then winks out only the portrait of Jesus abiding behind. Isn't that lovely? It's as though at the very end of a play, all about the risen Christ, the, the author suddenly, to everyone's astonishment, pops up in front of the actors and said, oops, sorry to be here. I just wanted to say there was so much more I could have shared with you, but from now on, it's over to you. And anyway, it's not about me, it's about him. Bye. And he pops out the way. You see what I mean? And all of that I, I find profoundly moving in that last um, 
in that, in that last uh, verse, but that is nothing remotely like what matters most. The really important word there in that final verse is another of the huge, big John words, and that's the word world. The world itself could not contain the books that would be written. I'm sorry to yet another Greek word, but it isn't a difficult word. The Greek word is cosmos, isn't it? And the literal meaning of that word is order. It comes from a root meaning of order. And so it, what it means is the cosmos, not just the world, the whole creation, but the creation as something that is designed for order, a, a something created with a designer, a purpose behind it, do you see what I mean, rather than chaos. Actually, the, I was thinking the English phrase created order exactly captures, I would suggest, do you think, the meaning of the word cosmos, the created order. This is about the whole universe that's been created for a purpose. Now, this word again comes, I've forgotten how many times in the Gospel of John, and I don't think I've even written it down, how embarrassing, but an awful lot of times, I can't, far more than in all the other ones put together. Sometimes the word is you, the word, it's almost invariably translated world in, your, in the English, so it's not at all difficult to see how often it comes. And sometimes it's purely neutral. Like in John 1 verse 9, again notice the word cosmos comes in the very beginning of the gospel and at the very, very end. As in 1 verse 9, the true light was coming into, must be Tom Cosmos or something, into the world. That's just a neutral description. The creator was in some astonishing way coming into the midst of the creation. Occasionally, the word means all humanity. Not very often, but occasionally. John 12, verse 19. Look, the whole world has gone after him. Well, that clearly means all, the, you know, all that's exaggeration, but all the crowd have gone after him. But much more commonly, in John's Gospel, as you will know, the word cosmos is a negative word. Uh, um, oh, if the world hates you, remember, remember that it hated me before you. Uh, in the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Righteous Father, the world does not know you, but I know you. So what John is, I think, trying to suggest to us is that this extraordinary cosmos, this vast universe creation, has somehow gone wrong. And I think what he, I suggest that what uh, he's talking about in much of his gospel is the world in the sense of bad systems. Um, you know, the way in which bad structures and institutions and systems can oppress people and make good people do bad things. I think it's a bit better. Someone like Bishop Helen Ann would be much better to talk about it. Probably all of this than I ever will be. But uh, I think in that sense, it's close to St. Paul's teaching about the spiritual powers, the stoichia, these invisible but real forces. I've never forgotten when I was, just before I retired as Bishop of Stafford, talking to a chap called Robert Archer, who was the QC, who just started then doing an inquiry into Stafford Hospital. Do you remember? It had a catastrophic failure. And I remember him saying to me then, he said, I've done a number of these things, and one of the difficulties is that people will look for scapegoats. And he says, sometimes there will be scapegoats, and if there are, I will name them, because we must do that in order to learn and move on. But, he said, what I've learned again and again, as I suppose he must have made a speciality of uh, public inquiries, I, I forget that he was a very impressive person. What I've learned again and again is that when things go badly wrong in a place like a hospital, it's bad systems that cause them. A bad ideology or a bad government policy or a bad whatever that leads good people to do bad things. And that is exactly what St. John means by the world hating you. Do you see what I mean? A bad system, and it can infect churches every bit as much. This is really going to cheer you up, isn't it? As it will, any, but it can, or any other part of human life or activity, or indeed creaturely life and activity. And in that sense, the world is a, a, a deeply challenging and will frequently be hostile place for us um, to be. And yet, and here uh, I come to the end, um, the astonishing thing is that despite all those negative phrases, in the end, John is saying to us, Jesus Christ came into the world to die for the whole world. The most famous of all texts in John's Gospel, chapter 3, verse 16, for God so loved the world that he sent his only son. Not God did not send his son in order to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Notice what he does not say. 
He does not say God so loved the church or God so loved the human race, but God so loved the cosmos, the entire environment, the universe, the whole thing, and came to die in order to change the world. Uh, and if you look at one other example in conclusion, John 17, that extraordinary prayer of Jesus, which opens out like all good prayer, begins with just the intimacy of Jesus and the Father, moves out to include the disciples, and culminates, after the stuff about the world does not know you, with things like, um, that the world may believe, that the world may know, that the whole cosmos may in some astonishing way come to recognize you as its Lord through the dying of Jesus Christ on the cross. Here's William Temple on John 3.16. No object is sufficient for the love of God short of the world itself. Christianity is not one more religion of individual salvation, differing from its fellows only and offering a different road to that goal. It is the one and only religion of world redemption. Of course, central to it is a way of individual salvation too, as the words before and after this great saying show. But its scope is infinitely wider than that, as wide as the love of God. It is the sin of the world that Christ came to take away. That is not to be universalist. It's not to say we don't have free choice as to whether to choose for Jesus or against him. But it is to say, as this final verse makes clear, that the object of uh, Jesus' living and dying, being born amongst us, bridging the gap between him and us, is the transformation of the universe. And that will happen, says John in this conclusion, by changed lives. The reason the world cannot, would not be able one day to contain all the books that would be written is because these are stories about you and me and the millions and millions and millions of Christians who've come since the gospel was written and please God will continue to come in the future. The whole cosmos will in the end be unable to contain the transforming beauty of people's changed lives. Do you see what I mean? An astonishing prospectus. And I don't begin to know all that it could, obviously, I don't know a stupid thing to say, uh, all that it means. But I think we, it, this is where I will finish because I can't think of any more transcendent vision in terms of bridging the gap between God and the church and the world than that, that, that extraordinary conclusion to John's gospel. There's so much more to be said, but now it's over to us. And our abiding, our bearing witness, and our transformed lives will in the end uh, uh, make possible, in some inconceivable way, the transformation of the whole cosmos. And that's incredible, but part of what you and I uh, are called to do. But it's back to Kakubri. <laughs> Thank you. colleague said to me yesterday, yesterday afternoon, there must be a lot more brilliant speakers in this country or you have lassoed the best. <laughs> Which do you think it is? The best. the best. We have been so lucky. Gordon, when you mentioned uh, Jerry Hughes, there's one story about him which is a real favourite of mine. He's in a group, probably at a gathering like this, and they're introducing themselves, and they go around the group. And my name's David, and I'm a solicitor. My name's Mary, I'm a teacher. And they go around the group. And Jerry happens to be the last. And he said, my name is Jerry Hughes, and I am a unique manifestation of God's love and glory. <laughs> if the truth is no, we are all that. But you have brought your uniqueness to us. You have been so generous in sharing your love with us and in your brilliant teaching you have pointed us to the glory we are so grateful and I'd like to turn back to you a quote you said yesterday you, you quoted thank you for being you we thank you for being you 
and being with us. Thank you. Thank you.